Even if you think you're unfamiliar with anamorphic lenses, I guarantee you've seen them in use throughout pretty much your entire life. Even though they're most often associated with movies and TV shows, there's Anna more than meets the eyes when it comes to anamorphic lenses. So let me start off by saying this is not a specific review about any kind of anamorphic lens. I have two, which I'm fortunate enough to have. This is the Sure 75 millimeter and the one that I'm filming on right now, which is the Sure 50 millimeter, both full frame, which is really cool because full frame anamorphic is awesome. And if you're saying, hey, Tom, what's so awesome about it? It looks pretty much the same. Well, this is an anamorphic shot, but I've just cropped it in to fill the frame like normal. And now this is the regular, actual anamorphic aspect ratio. And there are a lot of different anamorphic lenses out there, some more expensive than the Sure, some less expensive. But a thing to remember, a thing to be aware of before we jump into this video, is that they are highly specialized. So the best thing to do if you're kind of interested in anamorphic lenses might be to rent one first, see how you like it, and then you can decide if you wanna actually make the purchase. Now that we have that out of the way, I'm gonna tell you how awesome anamorphic lenses are, and you'll probably want one by the end because they're really cool and super fun. Anyway, it's probably important to start off by just asking like what even is an anamorphic lens? They've been around for about 100 years at this point, and where they really came into popularity was in the mid 20th century because movie studios and theaters wanted to draw more people to the theaters. To get people into the theater, they needed to do something larger than life, and one way to do that was to have bigger, wider screens, but in order to shoot movies that could actually be projected on those bigger and wider screens, the standard lenses and the standard film wasn't working. So anamorphic lenses were developed to basically squeeze more of a field of view onto the regular cameras and film that the studios were using. And that was purely a cost cutting measure. So anamorphic lenses allowed for different aspect ratios to be used with existing equipment. And that's pretty much how they still work. Whenever you film with an anamorphic lens, the footage is squeezed. So right now I know I look all beautiful and cinematic, but this is what the footage looks like when I first put it into Final Cut Pro. It's great if you need to lose a bit of weight in a hurry, but it also does not look natural at all. So you need to boop, de-squeeze the footage so that way it looks a bit more natural and then you get all of the great anamorphic quality. So even though they originally came about as a cost cutting measure, since anamorphic lenses have been used in movies and TV shows for so many decades at this point, their look is something that we tend to heavily associate with something being movie-like or cinematic as to use a buzzword like the kids do. But up until recently, they were prohibitively expensive, so no mere mortal, mere individual like you or I could probably afford one. And now we can literally just buy one that works with a Sony mirrorless camera, like it's insane. So that's pretty exciting. If you notice the lens element on the front is square and the lens element on a normal lens is round, Normal lenses are sometimes referred to as spherical lenses and anamorphic lenses are the anamorphic lenses. Probably should have known where that sentence was going before I started it. So in addition to just wider aspect ratios, some things you might notice with an anamorphic lens are the shape of the bokeh instead of being perfectly round, especially near the edge of the frame, they become a little more oval shaped. Anamorphic lenses tend to be incredibly sharp near the center and then a little less sharp towards the edges. So it gives this very kind of specific look to them. And of course, if I go over here and turn on this light, one of the most well-known qualities of an anamorphic lens is the lens flare, which adds some flare to your productions. Some people love lens flares and some people really dislike them. I think they're a cool creative tool that can be in your creative tool kit and you can use them when necessary. Like right now, I like having this light behind me. So when I want strategically, I can be like, oh, what? Just lens flare it out and then whoop, back to normal. But the problem is that I think a lot of people are under the misconception that an anamorphic lens is just to add lens flares to your image. And there's way easier ways to add flares to something than buying an entirely new lens or lens lineup. There's more to anamorphic. There's more to anamorphic than because these have become so much more accessible in recent years, they're not just for movies anymore. I've seen them in use on documentaries, on lower budget productions, and on YouTube videos. Sometimes I'll use my anamorphic lenses just for fun when filming a video, even if I end up cropping in so you don't even notice necessarily that I'm filming with an anamorphic lens. And I also really like using them for product B-roll because sometimes it can just really make things look epic and cinematic. I've checked the list of YouTube buzzwords, yes. 
in a really cool way. So actually, just to show the difference, here's the same shot with two 50 millimeter lenses. One of them is just my normal Sony EF 50 millimeter 1.8, and the other is my Sure 50 millimeter anamorphic lens. So right away, what we should notice is that the anamorphic lens has a much wider field of view. You can see more on the left and right sides of the frame. But you might be thinking, Tom, if I want to see more of a frame, why don't I just use a wider lens? I don't need an anamorphic lens. The difference is, even though the 50 millimeter anamorphic shot in this case is wider, we don't lose the background compression. So the 50 millimeter background compression, how close the background looks to the subject and how blurry the background is and all of those awesome qualities of a 50 millimeter lens, those aren't lost. Those are still there, but it's just wider. So there's really no other way to get that level of background compression and that wide field of view without using an anamorphic lens. And that's really kind of the superpower of anamorphic. So now that we've covered kind of the basics of what an anamorphic lens is, let's talk about how you can use an anamorphic lens. A few things to note though, anamorphic lenses, as far as I know, they're all manual focus. I don't know of an autofocus anamorphic lens. So you have manual focus and manual aperture. Pretty much any anamorphic lens you're going to encounter is going to be designed as a cinema lens, which means it's going to have geared aperture and focus ring. So that way, if you put it on a camera rig and you have like a focus motor or a focus dial connected to it, you can use the lens that way like you would with any other cinema lens, but of course you can still just turn them by hand as well. It can be difficult to focus because it's all manual focus and the image is squished. So it's sort of hard sometimes to determine if everything is exactly in focus, depending on your camera. Like I know a lot of Panasonics have an anamorphic mode where they will de-squeeze the footage for you inside the camera. And some on-camera monitors or recorders also have anamorphic modes as well. But if you're like me and you don't have anything that has any of that, you just have to try your best. Now, a big thing to be aware of is a normal lens has an aperture that's measured with f-stop and anamorphic lenses, and a lot of cinema lenses actually, have apertures that are measured in t-stops. f-stop refers to how wide the lens's aperture is, so how much light is coming through the lens. t-stop is actually more accurate, which is why more like cinema cameras or cinema lenses tend to use it, and that's measuring the amount of light that's actually making it through the lens onto the camera's sensor, or in the older days, onto a piece of film. So both of my anamorphic lenses are T2.9, and if you're asking what that is in f-stop, I don't really know. They seem pretty. You can kind of see what this looks like. It's 50 millimeters at T2.9. It looks pretty equivalent to like f 2.8 ish to me. I had to look up if there's an easy way to convert f-stop to t-stop. And what I found from expertphotography.com says, it is the f-stop corrected by the actual ratio light transmittance. You can calculate it by dividing the f-stop of the lens by the square root of light transmittance. So the only thing I know about transmittance is that they're what you wear on your hands when it's cold. I'm terrible at math. I have an English degree. In fact, I have my English degree right here. And you might be asking, why do you have that? Well, it's to prove that I'm bad at math, but also because mine is signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was governor when I graduated from college and now his signature is on my degree. So I guess you could say there's only one degree of separation between me and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Nice. But beyond that, an anamorphic lens is going to work the same as any other lens. You point it at something, you focus it, you adjust your exposure and then you film and hopefully it looks really cool whatever you film. Which is why I wanted to go to a super cool location with this 75 millimeter lens to film some anamorphic shots. But while there are a lot of special things about anamorphic lenses, they are very, very specialized. And that doesn't mean you need special eyes to use them, but you should realize that they can kind of be pricey and it might be something that you're not going to use all the time. And I think when an anamorphic lens is used well, it's a feast for the eyes. And if you're giving your eyes a feast, why not your ears as well? So speaking of music, thank you to Artlist for sponsoring this video because when you're making your amazing project with whatever lens you choose to use, you might need some music to go along with it. If you've been around here for a while, you might know that I've used Artlist literally since day one of starting my YouTube channel. And Artlist's royalty-free music library is always expanding and their license, as I've said many times, is second to none. And there are a few different plans to choose from. There is a personal plan with a monthly payment option that will let you use Artlist music on all of your personal accounts and platforms. But if you want to take it a step further, there is also the unlimited plan that's what I have where you can use artlist music on any platform on any account forever so it's great for personal work client work and professional work and artlist has always been my number one place to go when I need music and I don't want to have to worry about whether or not it's going to be okay to use or I'm gonna have the rights to use it I just go straight to artlist so 
Thank you again to Artlist for sponsoring this video. And if you would like two additional months on your annual subscription plan, be sure to use my link in the description below. Now, once you have your anamorphic footage captured and you put it into your editing software, your first question is going to be, well, how do I make this look not terrible? The first step is to de-squeeze it. And you really have two options here. One, you can create a timeline that is an anamorphic aspect ratio. Now, if you do want to dive more into the like, legit world of anamorphic lenses, I highly recommend a YouTube channel called Anamorphic on a Budget. Tito, who runs that channel, also put together this really cool tool, which is an anamorphic aspect ratio calculator, because if you're bad at math like me, or you just find it confusing, you can put in your lens, your camera, your output resolution, all your settings into the calculator, and it will tell you how to create the correct aspect ratio for the equipment that you're using specifically. So I'll put links to both of those things in the description because they're very helpful resources if you wanna dive a little bit further and expand your knowledge in the land of anamorphic lenses. But if you end up doing what I do a lot of the time, which is mixing anamorphic and non-anamorphic footage, then that's just when you end up with letterbox black bars at the top bottom of your frame. For example, in this project, most of my YouTube videos are 3840 by 1920, which is a two to one aspect ratio. It's a little bit wider than a standard 16 by nine. But if I put my anamorphic footage in here, it's going to still look really strange. Normally I have to scale up the footage to fill the two to one aspect ratio a little bit. But in this case, since my lenses are 1.6 times crop, all I need to do that 0.6 is very important. I just go to the Y axis in Final Cut Pro and change that to 66% instead of 100%. And that's going to de-squeeze the footage and then I can just scale it up until it fills the frame the way that I want it to. A lot of anamorphic lenses, especially other ones from Sure, are 1.3 times squeeze factor. So in that case, you would just change the Y axis to 33% instead of 66%. And it should look pretty good. I don't know if that's the super technically correct way to do it, but it works fine for me. It also means if you're running a camera with an anamorphic lens into an ATEM Mini, you can make that same Y-axis adjustment within the ATEM software, and then you can stream using an anamorphic lens that's de-squeezed in real time. It's pretty cool and super unnecessary, but really cool. And one thing I should also mention is that anamorphic lenses, as far as I know, are pretty much always prime lenses. You're not going to find a zoom anamorphic lens, although it would be really cool if possible to have a line of power zoom anamorphic lenses because then that lineup could be the mighty anamorphic power range. So we've covered what an anamorphic lens is, how to use it, why would you want to use it, and when would you want to use it, I guess, is the next question you might have. One of the most practical ways to use an anamorphic lens is if you want more options to reframe your shot in post-production. So if you take anamorphic footage and you put it on a normal timeline, like right now, this shot is anamorphic, but it's filling up the whole frame just like normal. This then gives me a whole bunch of space on either side that I can crop to without losing a single pixel of resolution. And this can be super helpful if you want to play with your framing throughout a video. For example, if some shots you want to be directly in the center, but other shots you want to be off to the side, so that way you can put a graphic or a video or something like over your shoulder. So it gives you a lot of flexibility when it comes to reframing your shots using just one video file. It's also really fun to use that anamorphic cinema movie-like quality to emphasize certain things in your video projects. For example, I've seen a lot of documentaries that are filmed with normal kind of like handheld B-roll and like out in the world, but then their sit-down interviews are filmed with anamorphic lenses and that quality of going from sort of real world chaos to beautiful lockdown anamorphic shot is really captivating and really effective. And again, like I mentioned earlier, I love using my anamorphic lens for product B-roll shots because sometimes when I'm talking and then it just cuts to an anamorphic thing, it just, it really snaps somebody's attention back to the video and what's happening. You can emphasize certain things in a really, a really cool way. Another thing is that anamorphic lenses are really fun for photos. It's the same thing, you just put it into Photoshop or whatever video editor you're using and then you just drag it and de-squeeze it pretty much till it looks normal. And then, especially if you have a wide angle monitor like this, here's an anamorphic photo of Ben, our dog, which looks really great because the lens is so high quality and on an ultra wide monitor like this, it just fits perfectly. So it's a really fun thing to do with just regular photos. And then if you do vertical anamorphic, that gets weird and super interesting. I even uploaded a YouTube short that was vertical anamorphic. I think it's probably the only 
at this point, vertical anamorphic short on YouTube. So that's an achievement to be proud of. And again, while this video is not a specific review of my anamorphic lenses, since I have them, I should tell you a few things about them. I really like the Sure lenses because I think they have the perfect balance between price and functionality. They are, again, not the cheapest lenses out there, but also not the most expensive. And what you get is a really high quality lens. The thing that really blows me away about both these lenses is how sharp they are. It can sometimes be tricky to nail focus, but once you nail focus, it's just so unbelievably sharp and crisp. And I'm really hoping the shot is in focus because otherwise that's gonna just kill my entire point here. The build quality on these are also like, it feels like military grade anamorphic lens over here. They're built incredibly well. And another thing that I really like is they don't really flare out of control. Yes, if I point a bright light source directly into the lens, it's going to flare. I'll even take my phone, turn on the little light here and maybe get some flares. Even that's kind of hard to flare. So. This big bright light back here that's pointed directly at the lens, yes, it's creating a flare. But, that's an a flare to remember, and everything else is not. This tube light over here is not creating any flares. My key lights and everything are not creating like glows or flares or anything. I know in some of the previous lenses and some of the pre-release versions, flaring was kind of crazy and out of control. And in this case, it seems like the lenses only flare when you really want them to. If you point it at the sun or directly at a super bright light, then you'll get a flare, but otherwise you won't. You're just going to have a really nice looking shot. They do something kind of strange, which isn't a big deal, but they shift the color temperature very warm in my experience. So normally when I film in here, I set my white balance to 4200 Kelvin and I get the color temperature that I like. But when I put the anamorphic lenses on it, I need to shift all the way down to 3600 Kelvin to get kind of the same color temperature that I would normally get. It's very easy to work with something like that if you just shift your white balance or you film in raw where you can adjust it in post, but definitely something to be aware of. Ultimately, my goal with this video is to just sell you on the idea that anamorphic lenses are a thing. And if you're not aware of them or you've always been kind of intimidated or unsure about them, I think that they're a ton of fun and definitely something that's worth checking out. And speaking of things that are a ton of fun, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. And if you're just itching to focus on more lens videos, there's Anamore where this came from.